That's part of the reason we're here, is to talk about what climate change is already doing and what we can do about it. So I'm really excited to have you here. My name is Danielle Métis. I'm a climate scientist by training, community activist, and I met many of you recently on the campaign trail or as a candidate for county council at large. I'm really excited about today's lineup because we have folks from all different parts of the climate movement, different parts of our county and our country, talking about what they've done what climate change has done in their lives and what they've done to fight back and what we can all do together. We have dozens of groups here and they are here to do amazing work. And we've all come together as a community to talk about what we can do. So you'll notice there's some really great activities. One is talking about our carbon footprint. And it's really great to talk about what we can do because we need to set examples for other folks. But the big take home message we have here is that it's not about individual actions, one and one and one person. It's about us coming together collectively. We're here as a community in the executive office building, in the, uh, you know, the seat of our local government, to let our local leaders know that we're serious about climate action. That we know there's a lot we can do at the local level and the state level, because we know it's not happening at the national level. And so we're here to send that message that we want real action. 
and there's more than a dozen, two dozen tables here talking about different angles and different aspects, but all of it leads up to collective action. Collective action for renewables, collective action for waste disposal, for transit, right? for talking about what we do with our water and our cars and so on, collectively. So just want to keep that in mind. Again, this coalition has come together. It's Rise for Climate, Jobs, and Justice. We are one of hundreds of events taking place all over the world over this weekend, from San Francisco to Paris um, and beyond. Groups are getting together to demand local action. We, all because of the uh, Global Climate Action Summit, which is taking place right now in California. That's sort of been the, the catalyst. But there's another catalyst that you know, came together at the same moment, and that's right here in Montgomery County. We are cutting edge leaders when it comes to decision making and the resolutions we've passed. Last December, Montgomery County passed an emergency climate re mobilization resolution, declaring climate an emergency in Montgomery County. So yeah, let's... <laughs> we were the first county in the country to, I mean, it seems obvious, well, of course it's an emergency, but yet most of our governments are not saying that, and they're certainly not acting that way. But when something is an emergency, you don't just go on with business as usual. You also don't have to run around in panic. Think of us as all like emergency workers, like firefighters or ambulance drivers. Those folks run into emergencies because they're prepared. They don't panic, they know what needs to be done, and that's what we need to do. We need to train ourselves to understand this climate emergency and move towards it so we can solve it. So that's what today is about, and we're gonna start, we're gonna bring in our first speaker, and then after that we're gonna talk about things that you can do, because we don't want anybody to leave here today feeling like, well, that was a nice speech, but what now? Everybody should walk away with a whole toolbox of things they can actually do. So for our first speaker, um, I don't have a bio, because honestly, he doesn't really need an introduction, but um, I have to say all the way from wonderful District 20, where he was our state senator, uh, woo, thank you, District 20, um, but now, of course, he now commutes slightly further down to Capitol Hill, where Representative Jamie Raskin represents us in, you know, in the eastern part of the county, but frankly, he's really representing progressives all over the country. So, let's hear it for our fantastic Thank you, Thank you, Montgomery County Rise for Climate. Uh, and I want to thank our co-conveners, 350 Montgomery County, Climate First, Sierra Club Montgomery County, the Climate Mobilization, Montgomery County Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions, and Interfaith Power and Light. Let's salute them for bringing us together. And all the co-sponsors, too. Uh, we have gone from um, our uh, global scorching summer with all of the drought and discomfort to our fall monsoon period uh, under climate change. Um, this summer I started uh, saying on Capitol Hill that here it's not the heat, it's the stupidity uh, that, uh, that's threatening our, our lives. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm so cheered and encouraged by uh, such a dramatic turnout here today. This is really impressive. I want to salute everybody who got up early to, um, to, to brave the rains to be here. Um, and of course, uh, there's a, a very conscious political strategy in the country now to try to demoralize the environmental forces, to discourage people, to say the changes that we're talking about are impossible. Um, and uh, Remember that that's a conscious strategy to try to uh, demobilize and de-energize people. But I know a little something about impossible in politics because, um, as Danielle uh, reminded everybody, I started my political career in District 20. I was running against a 32-year incumbent who was president pro tem of the Maryland Senate who had been... Uh, introduced electricity deregulation that made everybody's bills go up 70%, was trying to expand the death penalty, uh, was blockading marriage equality, all this stuff. So I said, I'm going to run. And my favorite story about the campaign is that when I first announced there was a pundit quote in the Washington Post who said, Raskin's chances of victory are considered impossible. And nine months later, we got 67% of the vote. And there was another article uh, quoting a pundit who said Raskin's victory was inevitable. 
So we have an impossible to never go nine months because the pundits are never wrong. And this movement is going from impossible to never go. Um, and the way to do it um, is the way I've always tried to do it. I remember when I first announced in that campaign and I laid out everything I wanted to do, like uh, passing laws to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions and restore voting rights to the former prisoners and abolish the death penalty uh, in Maryland and pass marriage equality and on and on. And a woman came up to me at our, uh, at our first you know, opening kickoff and she said, Jamie, great speech, I love your speech, but one thing, take out everything you got in there about gay marriage. This is back in 2006. Because she said it's never going to happen and you know it's never going to happen. And even the gay candidates don't talk about it. And it makes you sound like you're really extreme, like you're not in the political center. And I kind of had to swallow hard because I didn't have a lot of attendees with me that day. Uh, and I, I said, you know, I appreciate your telling me that because it makes me realize it's not my ambition to be in the political center, which blows around with the wind. It's my ambition to be in the moral center. And that's why I'm a Democrat. And I'm a and bring the political center to us. And that's what the climate change movement is doing all across America and all across the world, uh, this day and every day. Trying to develop a consensus to break from the carbon barons and the fossil fuel industries that are like a dagger at the throat of humanity. Now, um, I've been in office in uh, the House of Representatives uh, since January of 2017. Uh, and I took office the same month as, uh, as our president did. Uh, you know, and I don't really mark this period from the moment of his inauguration. I don't know how many of you guys went to the inauguration. I, I couldn't make it myself. <laughs> but I, um, but uh, I watched it and I, I liked the speech just fine. I would have preferred it in the original Russian that it arrived in. <laughs> But I mark this period not from uh, that moment, but rather from the next day, January 21st, with the great women's march on Washington. Uh, and that was the moment when um, the three most beautiful words of the Constitution, the three first words, came alive, we the people. And um, the women's movement establish the framework, the moral framework for understanding this period that we're in. Uh, presidents come and go, government officials come and go, those of us who aspire to attain a public office are nothing but the servants of the people. Here, the people govern, the people are sovereign, and the people have their eyes on the prize. We have got to focus on climate change and dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions immediately. Immediately. Um, and and I, uh, I remember I was walking back, I had a couple of my kids, my two, my two daughters with me uh, at the Women's March, and uh, one of them said, Daddy, what do you think? I said, I said that was one of the greatest political moments of my life, that march. Uh, and I said, I, I only had one complaint, there were no chants about the emoluments clause in it. <laughs> and my daughter Tabitha said, well, Dad, nothing rhymes with the emoluments clause. You can't chant. So I took that as a challenge, and I said, OK, well, how about this? Uh, stop Trump, stop Pence, impeach them for emoluments. Uh, 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 I, I, I raise it because uh, I decided I was going to mark this period by uh, writing a chant for each one of the marches, and um, the next march was the science march. So I said, uh, okay, for that one, um, it'll be yes to science, yes to reason, no to Trump, and no to treason. Uh, and then uh, the climate march, uh, and I assume you guys were at the climate march, that was a great one. Uh, and uh, there were huge forest fires taking place at the time, and so uh, I got to march past the White House. I don't know if you guys were part of that, yeah. but uh, and so my offering there was simply Trump, you liar! Our forests are on fire. There we go. Uh, so I I want to say that um, it's a it's a mistake to think of this as the problem of just one man. Now it's true that one of the very first things the president did was to pull us out of the the Paris Climate Accord. 
which was an absolute catastrophe that made America an international pariah and outcast um, in the community of nations for doing that. We went from being a leader on climate change to being uh, a, a laggard and opponent of the community of nations. And obviously that's something that we gotta turn around. But it's not just him. I wish I could come back from the House of Representatives and tell you that everybody was against the precedent on this, but it's not true. Uh, I'll tell you about a conversation I had with uh, a Republican friend of mine, who I like very much, and you know, I, I come from Annapolis where we try to do things in a bipartisan way. I'm a middle child, I like to bring people together, and you know, I, I don't give up on anybody. Um, but I, we were sitting there in committee and I said to him, you know, we can disagree about a lot of stuff. You know, we can disagree about uh, your terrible tax plan, and we can disagree about reproductive freedom, what have you. But on climate change, this is the whole future of our species that we're talking about, and you guys have got to um, get over it and join the international scientific consensus about what's happening. He said, he said, well, Jamie, you got your scientists and we got our scientists. And I said, that's not how science works, you know? It's not rival partisan teams. And so well, we've got a computer there and I go and I take him uh, to all of the uh, websites of the great government installations here in the 8th District at NIH and NOAA and, you know, we go to the CIA, all of them, say all the professional scientists agree that climate change is real. We are in a civilizational emergency. It's here, right? And so here's his response. His response was, well, I don't want to get a big fight with you, but he said, I'm going to tell you something about professionals. Professionals built the Titanic. Amateurs built Noah's Ark. Think about it. So it took a moment for that to sink in with me, okay? Uh, and I said, wait, does this mean that you want uh, an amateur flying you back to Texas this weekend? Or you want an you know, amateur performing open heart surgery on someone in your family? Or you just saying you want two members of our species to survive, you know? Uh, so uh, all of which is to say that um, the, uh, the rot of climate change denialism and the propaganda promoting it have sunk deeply into the political consciousness of uh, big parts of the country. Um, and so it's not about just changing the occupant of one office, but it's about changing the entire political mentality of the country. And as Danielle was saying, we are in an emergency and we've got to remember that, we gotta act like it. When I announced for Congress, I said, I would never be caught talking about climate change as an issue. It's not an issue. It's the entire context within which we must address all of the issues of the day, whether it's energy or foreign policy or housing or the budget. It is the entire context within which we have to operate. So, um, you know, I, this crowd doesn't need to be reminded of what uh, the stakes are. We've seen hundreds of thousands of uh, acres uh, of forest fire in our country this year. Uh, the polar ice cap continues uh, to melt away. The polar bears are drowning because they're good swimmers, but they're not indestructible, and they just can't make it. The walruses are disappearing. They found mosquitoes up in the North Pole, there are really sweeping, breathtaking changes taking place on a daily basis now. Um, and we're seeing uh, the proliferation of diseases and plagues like, uh, you know, lice and ticks, which are my favorite, uh, you know, all over the country and all over the world. Uh, because of the changes that are that are taking place. So we've got to get on an emergency footing about this at every level, at the federal level, at the state level, at the county level, at the local level. And that's why I'm so delighted that you guys have come here um, to, to do this. We want to get to 100% clean renewable energy in America, right? That's got to be our goal. Um, We need every level of government to be dramatically reducing greenhouse gas emissions so we can get to you know, an 80% cut by 2025 or 2027. Um, 
whatever we can do, and I want Montgomery County and I want Maryland to be leaders, to be a beacon to the country on how this can be done. Um, so I, I'll just leave you with this thought. You know, if, if we want to stop climate change, um, we need to change the political climate. And, um, you know, one of our great Marylanders from our history, Frederick Douglass, uh, once said something that was so profound, which is, he said, uh, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. The struggle may be moral, it may be physical, it may be moral and physical, but there must be struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. Frederick Douglass is telling us we've got to fight at every level. We've got to fight. And I'll leave you finally with the words of the great Tom Paine, uh, who wrote at the time of the American Revolution a, a pamphlet called The Crisis in, to, in order to encourage people through an especially dark and gloomy period where people didn't know which way things were going. Um, and people were cynical uh, about the power of popular majorities to really overcome entrenched political power and the king. Um, and people were defecting and people were confused and everybody's running around saying, what's the message? What's the message? You know? And uh, Tom Paine wrote this great pamphlet and he, I'm going to update the language a little bit so it doesn't um, uh, offend modern sensibilities. But he said, um, these are the days that try men and women's souls. These are the days that try men and women's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will shrink at this moment from the service of their cause and their country, but everyone who stands with us now will win the love and the favor and the affection of every man and every woman for all time. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered, but we have this saving consolation. The more difficult the struggle, the more glorious in the end is our victory. That victory will be ours in the climate change movement if we organize and we do our job. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here. introduce our next speaker. We really thought hard about the speakers because we really want to make sure people understand the breadth and depth of the climate movement. You may not see it in this room right now, but all across the country, all kinds of folks are leading this and we need everybody's input. Our next speaker is phenomenal. Jancy, um, Jansique Medita Taya. It's important to get people's names properly. She goes by Jancy. She's a member of the Fiscalpa Indian Nation which is one of the local tribes here. So I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that we are actually standing on land that somebody else lived on first and that was taken from them. And so I really I want to introduce a phenomenal um, activist. Jancy is a junior at Montgomery Blair High School, lives in Silver Spring, Maryland. She's a young activist bringing attention to the intersectionality of native sovereignty, the environment, and feminism. Jancy and her friend, Hemak Hemakshi Gordy, won first prize in the CSEN C-SPAN student camp competition for their film, No Trespassing, Seeking Justice for Native Women. I'm uh, now very excited to introduce our next speaker, Jansen. Hi everyone, I'm Jansen Koemidit Tayak. How's everyone doing? Yeah. Okay, I know you guys can do better than that. Come on, how's everyone doing today? junior at Montgomery Blair High School and I'm a member of the Piscataway Indian Nation so as many of you may not know we are from the Washington DC area and from the Potomac River um, so our roots run very deep into the land that is here and everything we do every belief we have every ceremony it connects to one central idea which is our mother earth so my name, Jancy Quay, means beautiful river woman. That is my special connection to the earth. It's named after the Potomac River. And we all have a special connection, even though I think it's hard for some people to see it. Because after all, our mother earth is the one thing that connects all of us. So as a native young woman, to see and grow up seeing our rivers polluted with trash and oil, seeing our mountaintops blown off and our forests burned in huge fires, to see our women raped by coal industry workers, tearing up our land with no consequences, 
to hear my ancestors crying at me saying, what are you doing to our home? What are you doing to the one thing that's given you life and the one thing that has connected us all? What is one little girl supposed to do in a dying world with half the nation against her and a Cheeto for a president? You know, <laughs> all these things that are happening are not warnings anymore. These giant storms, these giant forest fires, all this mass extinction, it's happening right now with my generation here to face it. I felt completely hopeless until one day about a year ago, I stepped into what's called the Uptown Art House and I saw a room full of PCM volunteers making art for the People's Climate March. And I saw a room full of people fighting for something that I thought people had given up on fighting for. I had never seen so much energy, I would never seen something like that in my life, and it sparked something inside of me. You know, I realized I was no longer just some helpless little girl. I was one heck of a powerful one. <laughs> I have a voice. I have a group of people here to support me. And that made me want to do as much as I can and fight as much as I can to make sure that no other young person has to feel helpless as I once did. Because they have the power to make change. They have the power to inspire so many people just using their voice. So I have a message for people like Donald Trump and for all the people who believe that climate change is just a joke. You better watch out, because I and my generation are your worst nightmare. Not because, not because we're going to single-handedly stop climate change, but because we are using our voices to bring people together and to inspire other, others, which is something that you will never be able to do. And when you have a group of people like that, change comes. And the change is now. Thank you.
next, our next speakers will be the, um, the executive director of IPL, Joel Novi, and Reverend Avi from uh, Cedar Lane, you, okay, Unitarian, Universalist. Um, the Reverend began serving as a senior minister of Cedar Lane in August 2013. Previously served UU congregations in Clearwater, Florida, Madison, Wisconsin, and Park Forest, Illinois. In the larger community, he's been actively involved in interfaith, multicultural, and social justice work for over two decades, including service as the president of the International Association for Religious Freedom, as a member of the executive team of Montgomery County's Interfaith Community Working Group, and as the internal review board of the National Cancer Institute and at NIH. So please welcome uh, Reverend Avi and Joel Lindsay. I live, move, breathe, and have my being right here in Rockville, and I serve Cedar Lane Unitarian University Church in Bethesda. And we are here on behalf of Montgomery County Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions and the faith communities of so many sacred traditions, religious communities in Montgomery County, masjids and ethical societies, temples, synagogues, and churches. Across our region, people of faith understand that our burning fossil fuels is pouring heat-trapping climate pollution into our atmosphere, damaging our climate. And we are here today because all of us share a sense of responsibility for the well-being of our neighbors. So we must address climate change because our damaged climate is already hurting our neighbors, neighbors close to home and around the world. <laughs> Tonight at sundown, my family will join Jewish communities across Montgomery County in celebrating Rosh Hashanah, the new year. The liturgy for this season is somber, and to be honest, it sometimes seems a little ominous to my ears. The words I will hear in synagogue tomorrow assert that on Rosh Hashanah it is written and on Yom Kippur it is sealed. Who will live and who will perish and how? This is the same way so many of us feel when confronting the climate crisis. When our country failed to address climate change over the last three decades, it was written. And when Trump rescinded the Clean Power Plan and pulled out of the Paris Agreement, it was sealed. No matter what we do now, we face the reality of a warming world. When my three-year-old son is my age, the world in which he celebrates Rosh Hashanah will be one characterized by more frequent heat waves, devastating floods, stronger storms, punishing droughts. But take heart. After Jewish communities recite that liturgy describing harsh judgment, we are offered a measure of hope and a pathway for action. repentance, and tefillah, prayer, and tzedakah, righteousness. Repentance, prayer, and righteousness avert the severity of the decree. This is what our sacred traditions can offer us in these times. That we live in these times is already written, but who we will be in these times is not yet sealed. Human beings coming together across difference and standing up as thousands have this weekend across the country 
can avert the severity of the decree. Every day, through the work of Interfaith Power and Light, and through Montgomery County's own Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions, I see people coming together to repent of the harm we have caused to our climate, to share our prayers for a better world, and to work together for stronger climate policy, starting by doing our part right here in Montgomery County and insisting that our own county council acknowledge the magnitude of the crisis and set out a visionary goal for addressing it. All right. Starting today, on this day the world was born, may we recommit to work together in Montgomery County to build a grassroots climate movement, the only thing powerful enough to avert the severity of the decree. There's an ancient Hindu prayer that says, May we join with each other to care for the earth, to restore the waters, to refresh the air, to renew the forests, to care for the plants, to protect the creatures, to strengthen the bodies, to renew our minds, to rejuvenate our spirits, to promote justice and peace, and to bring new life to everything. The Hindu tradition sets forth the proposition that the divine pervades all of creation, that it is present everywhere, both within and without, in all things. The tradition understands that humans are not separate from nature, that we are linked by spiritual, psychological, and physical bonds with the elements around us. It teaches a deep reverence for life and an awareness that the great forces of nature, earth, water, fire, air, and space, as well as the various orders of life, including plants and animals, trees and forests, are bound to each other within life's cosmic web. And this same value is deeply embedded in the seventh Unitarian Universalist principle which affirms and promotes the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Now the interdependent web is a tender metaphor. It recognizes that all life is a delicate blessing, tough only in that we all contribute to its strength. The web sustains us and we help sustain the web. And in the words of Chief Seattle, what we do to the web, we do to ourselves. So by lifting up the principle of interdependence as an article of faith, we affirm our commitment to promote a way of sustainable living that in turn promotes the well-being of all life forms and our planet. So given what we know about interconnectedness, and the beautiful dependencies of law, that the divine is shot through in the entire creation, and given the awe that we feel when we contemplate the vastness of the universe and our place in it, how are we to be in the world? And that is the deep spiritual and existential question. How are we to act, relate, to live out our faith and convictions as it is expressed in this image of the interconnected web? How does it apply to a world and a culture that believes that bigger is better and more the merrier? What are we called to be and to do to confront the climate crisis that is upon us now? What is called for as Pope Francis said, is a profound interior 
conversion. Now, a profound interior conversion goes beyond changing light bulbs in our homes and in our congregations. It goes beyond recycling regularly, beyond driving energy efficient cars or taking public transportation, goes beyond supporting local farms or growing our own vegetables. A profound interior conversion goes beyond voluntary simplicity and green consumerism and politely lobbying Congress, especially with the system rigged in favor of big oil, big coal, Halliburton, the Koch brothers, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Now, while doing all this is important, it is not enough. And that's what a profound interior conversion points us to. It means we have to make an even deeper commitment to dramatically change the way we live today. It means accepting willingly limits on the demands we make on the natural world and actually sacrifice for it. Now that's a term that we don't like to hear much, let alone practice. And it means confronting the imperatives of global equity that lie at the core of climate justice. It means working for environmental legislation that protects the lives and livelihoods of the most vulnerable and impose stricter environmental controls on corporations which use way far more resources than either private households or religious institutions. It means advocating for action on climate change by our local elected business and community leaders in our county and also at the national level. So what is called forth that all these sacred traditions point us toward is a profound interior conversion. Now I am preaching to the choir, so to speak, but at the same time, it is the choir that needs to take the first step and grow this choir more and more. On April 4th, 1967, a day before his assassination, Dr. King spoke at River, right, Riverside Church in New York City, where he denounced the Vietnam War. His words that he shared against the war speak equally well to the moral imperative of addressing climate change. We're now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We're confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. So now let us begin, he said. Now let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for a new world. And so I conclude with that ancient Hindu prayer as a blessing and a challenge. Om Bhumi Mangalam Udaka Mangalam Vayu Mangalam Agni Mangalam Gagana Mangalam Surya Mangalam Chandra Mangalam Jagat Mangalam, Jeeva Mangalam, Deha Mangalam, Mano Mangalam, Atma Mangalam, Sarva Mangalam, Bhavatu Bhavatu Bhavatu, Sarva Mangalam, Bhavatu Bhavatu Bhavatu, Om Shanti Shanti. So may it be. Okay, you're going to love this. I don't believe in climate change. No, I believe it's a climate emergency. Let's say it. What is it? A climate emergency. One more time. A climate emergency. Okay, a little louder so they hear 
Chris upstairs. Time is emergency. So my name is Jim Lawrenson. I'm uh, one of the founding members of the Montgomery County Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions, uh, which several faith-based congregations uh, got together last year and created with the assistance from IPL. Thank you, Joe Hell. Uh, and, and others to answer the moral and urgent call to unite people of faith in Montgomery County. And just to illustrate the need for that in the faith community, we quickly grew within months uh, to more than 30 congregations, over 150 members across all major denominations. Uh, currently, each member congregation is working with their leadership and their boards to obtain tailored pledges to meet or beat the county resolution goals and describe their specific faiths bases for their positions. Uh, many have already obtained uh, various levels of signed pledges, including uh, most of the Montgomery County Unitarian Universalist uh, churches, uh, Kol Shalom, Temple Emmanuel, Beth Chai, uh, Sharat Han uh, Nefesh, Sandy Spring, Friends, that Shalom, and others. If you want to know more about this initiative, or our group, or you belong to a faith-based group that might be interested in signing a similar pledge and joining us, see us at the table right there, where uh, we're seeing somebody wave, um, and sign up and find and get more information. Okay, so one more time, it's not climate change, it's a climate emergency. Thank you. Well, that was wonderful. Um, if you think that chanting was beautiful, you should hear Joelle do um, Yom Kippur, Kol Nidre prayers. They, whew, amazing. Um, so yes, thank you, Jim, for that. If you want your congregation to get involved, um, go over to the table over here. I just want to point something out that's really important for all of us to know in this room. This rally is really the, the rally rise for climate, jobs, and justice. Right? We talk about climate. But like I said in the beginning, climate change really is just a symptom. Right? Nobody set out to change the climate. It was a symptom of what we were doing. It was a symptom of burning fossil fuels. It was a symptom of an economy and an attitude that was about consumption, that was about taking, that ignored who they were taking from and what was being left behind. Right? It's about taking this land from the people who were here before. It was about taking millions of people from Africa and bringing them here against their will to, to work this land, right? It was about taking from countries all over the world to build the Western world. So we have an exploitive economy that has led to this, to a lot of the social problems, to the lack of jobs and the lack of justice and climate change. So we need to look at this holistically. And so it's important for us to look around and recognize that this room does not really reflect the world and it doesn't even reflect Montgomery County. We're a majority non-white county. And one out of every three people who lives in this county is not born here. And that's not the case for the majority of people in this room. So it's up to all of us to think about what we can do and where are the battles that we're not involved in. Because the way you build big coalitions is not by inviting people to your party, but by going and being allies in other people's struggles. Right? That's how you build, is you go and say, where is it that I need it? So um, with that in mind, well, so think about what you've heard our earlier speaker from the Piscataqua Nation. And now I'm going to introduce another speaker, um, Destiny Watford. Let's know off more high school and home, a local trash incinerator that would burn 4,000 tons of trash a day, 240 pounds of mercury, and 1,000 pounds of lead annually, was approved to be built in Baltimore. Watford found out, and she went into action. Enraged by the news of the incinerator, Watford, winner of the prestigious Golden Environmental Prize, gathered a group of students at our school, formed an advocacy group called Free Your Voice, and petitioned residents to stop its construction. In the end, it was stopped by an air quality permit issue, but there's no doubt that their presence in the shutdown was overwhelmingly felt. Recently honored as Essence's Woke 100 Women, Watford is passionate about staying vigilant about the issues in our community and beyond. Being woke equates to when you question things, she said. It's the beginning of recognizing that the things you thought were normal are not normal. They're injustice, they're obscene, they should not exist. Woo. That's right, that, that's right, they're obscene. Environmental injustice and building incinerators in people's neighborhoods is obscene. 
She continues to prevent the building of incinerators that cause one third of Baltimore's pollution. When we stand together united with a singular vision, this will not be our community, she said. Our community will not be a dumping ground. Very excited to introduce to you Destiny Watford. Hi. Um, you'll have to apologize. I apologize for my voice. I'm a little under the weather, but I'm happy to be here today with all of you. Um, I wanted to start by telling a bit of history about my neighborhood. I know, usually history is like the boring part of class, but I promise I have a point. <laughs> The year was 1972, and the small, predominantly black community of Fairfield, located in South Baltimore, an international multi-million dollar chemical company in the community was found guilty of discharging a strong scented greenish liquid, the exact nature of which was unknown. 1979. 700 people were forced to be evacuated when a tank car carrying sulfuric acid tipped over causing a massive chemical spill in the neighborhood. 1984, a chemical blast rocked the neighborhood of Fairfield. Residents reported going in outside only to see a huge cloud of dark black smoke and fumes that made them faint. One neighbor said that she could see the mushroom cloud like a bomb at Hiroshima. In the 1990s, the last house in Fairfield stood with its peeling paint and boarded up doors and windows and served as the only reminder, the only symbol that the community of Fairfield existed. Um, if you were to go to the community of Fairfield today, you wouldn't see that home. You wouldn't see any memory of there ever being a community there, of people living there, because in their place is a sea of polluting industries. like. Um, that chemical plant, um, like the city's landfill, like um, a coal pier that overshadows our uh, park in Curtis Bay with mountains of coal. This is our reality, this is our history. And what you're really focused in on and for your voice was changing that history, was stopping this long cycle of environmental injustice in our neighborhood and in Baltimore and seeing a new vision. Um, and I'm excited to say that we're building that, that we're paving that new path. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about how we were able to do that. Um, and I wanted to say that by telling you a story. Um, it's a story that I have grown quite fond of, but at the time, um, it made me really mad. <laughs> um, so back in high school, the group, once we learned about the incinerator, all the awful things and pollutants that it would cause, we went out in our neighborhood and we talked to residents. Um, and I remember walking up to this um, particular door and an older man answered, um, and I told him all about the incinerator, what we learned, what we were trying to do, we were fighting to stop it. And his response was um, that there's nothing that we can do, that Curtis Bay is and always will be a dumping ground, and that nothing we do or say will change that. Um, and at the time, I was really angry. We were all angry because we were fighting so hard and sacrificing so much in this fight and in this struggle. Um, but the reality was that the older man was right, that Curtis Bay was considered a dumping ground. Um, that had been its history um, that I relayed to you earlier. People in my neighborhood are forced to deal with um, high rates of lung cancer. I've lost so many neighbors to this who are dealing with respiratory disease and suffering from asthma. Um, an entire decade is shaved off of our lives because of where we live. So, what do we do with this reality? And what, would, what do we do with this, what we call in our group, this dumping ground mentality, this thought, this passive acceptance of the way that things are, of the way that things have been, of the history that's been forced upon us. Um, in our group, we wrote songs and uh, poems and shared our story 
um, in our fight in actively resisting the status quo. And I think the base lesson that I wanted to talk about here was that our environmental movement in Baltimore and Maryland needs this shift. It's going to take more than spewing facts um, to actually get the, do the job done and to get the change that we need in our city and in our state made. It's going to take shifting mentalities, shifting and changing hearts and minds. It was mentioned that, it was mentioned, I'm sorry, our recent fight, the fight against the Bresco incinerator in Baltimore. Raise your hand if you know what Bresco is. Okay, okay, so quite a bit of you. For those of you who don't know, Bresco is essentially Baltimore's worst idea for a welcome sign. It's an incinerator, and it says Baltimore right on the smokestack as you drive into town. Thank you. Um, and it creates one third of the air pollution in the city. And we're fighting hard every day to get Bresco shut down um, and to create a zero waste, uh, a new zero waste model in our city. <laughs> and we find ourselves reminded of the lessons that we've learned with the incinerator that it takes more than just facts and people sitting in a room talking about all the ways and all the reasons that incineration is bad. It takes shaping a narrative and shaping a movement of people on the ground who have suffered, people who are watching um, their communities be destroyed and their lives be destroyed by the, pollutions that we're, by the pollution and poison that we're breathing in every day. Um, and so that's what we're grappling with in Baltimore, but I also want to bring to light the reality that you're facing in Montgomery County. Montgomery County has an incinerator. Its contract ends in 2021. And right now, I want to move all of you to act. Um, right now, Montgomery County is making real moves. Um, you have amazing leaders here, and we all want to see trash incineration out of Baltimore, and specifically we want trash incineration out of um, your renewal portfolio standard um, by 2020. Um, so I guess, <laughs> I guess I just want to end by saying the repeating the lesson that I've been trying to get out throughout this entire speech, which is just that, just that like, one, we have to understand the, the long, deep, scary, and tragic history that we've come from when it comes to environmental injustice and social inequality, um, and also recognize that the issues that we're facing isn't just in the city or isn't just in Montgomery County. Like, the air moves, right? Like, we're breathing the same poison, and if we're going to actually have success, we have to blur those lines and work together. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that woman, that deserves a standing ovation for sure. Um, I just want to echo some of what Destiny was saying about what's going on here. I just wanted to bring up a little sign. Here's one of the Sierra Club signs. Dickerson's pollution needs a solution. We're talking about um, the incinerator. We have a trash incinerator in Dickerson, Maryland, in the Agricultural Reserve. Like she said, the contract is up in 2021. We need to work with our incoming council and with the county executive to close it. And we know that it's possible to do that in San Francisco. The city of San Francisco has a zero waste plan. They do not incinerate trash anymore. So we know that's possible. So that's one of the things that we can work on here in Montgomery County. Um, another, we're talking about renewable energy, and she talked about the renewable portfolio standard. Uh, there's a bill right now, the Clean Energy and Jobs Act, that's going to be in the state legislature again this year that would take trash out of the renewable portfolio standard and also encourage renewable energy. So you ought to give yourselves an applause. I mean, this is, this is a real accomplishment. Um, 
I want to say that, you know, I look at this as we have to finish the job this time. We have to finish it. Um, you know, I take a lesson from the Civil Rights Movement. We didn't finish it with the passage of the 60s, in the 60s of the Civil Rights legislation. We took a step, we did not finish it, and we're paying for it because we're refighting the same battles we fought then again today. And there was a climate movement before, there was the no nukes movement, we were gonna build a better, a better economy and a better environment, and we didn't finish it. And now we are watching this place melt down all the scientists were right and wrong at the same time. They were right that things were going to get worse. Their timelines were completely wrong. And I remember sitting with people and we, were, we would talk about how much time we had. And most people didn't believe the timelines. Most people thought science didn't fully understand what was coming. And so they could see the broader trend, but they couldn't see the speed with which things would devolve in the world and things have devolved faster than they thought. Things are heating up faster than they thought. Glaciers are melting faster than they thought. And this is worse than they thought and it's worse than they thought earlier. And there's going to be impacts on countries around the world earlier than they thought. And we have absolutely no plans and no thought about how to, in, how to deal with those impacts on those societies. We seem to take the view that people will simply move, and you've got to ask yourself where, yeah. how, how are they going to feed themselves? Are the people who they're going to move next to going to welcome them? Or is this going to trigger a series of conflicts that are going to be most unwelcome in the world at this time? And so I you know, do view this as an absolute emergency. So I was the lead sponsor of the legislation that went in declaring the climate emergency. And And, and I knew that it was going to be really hard to get to zero by 2035. But on the other hand, if we had picked a more comfortable number, 50% by 2035 or 70% by 2035, we might achieve that, but we wouldn't be where we needed to be. And I really believe that a goal of zero is the right goal. We will never be able to say we did what we set out to do. I would not want to be sitting in 2035 and watching people pat themselves on the back for achieving a 50% reduction because we know 50% by 2035 isn't going to get the job done. So sometimes you have to set an impossible goal in order to drive yourself continuously to try to achieve that goal. And I think that's what we set out for ourselves. Um, similarly, and you know, the, the issue of the incinerator came up. We need to shut the incinerator down. It is, it is wrong, and I was one of the citizens of Montgomery County who supported the anti-incinerator people when this fight came up years ago. Because we knew what came out of the smokestack of the incinerators and what would wind up in the river was not a particularly good idea. And this was not the way to go that reduce and recycle was the solution. It was the solution 30 years ago. Reducing and recycling is the solution now. And we've got to go about doing that work. And we need, you know, if we're going to get Montgomery County clean, that incinerator has to go out our portfolio. And that plant that we have, the power plant we have in Montgomery County, needs eventually to be shut down because that plant is an abomination. And Hogan did, and his group did agree finally to set stricter standards for the plant, but the stricter standards for the plant aren't still where we need to be. Close down so the I hope. Down the power plant. Hmm? Close down the incinerator the power plant. Yes, and so hopefully we get to move in those directions. But there's a bunch of other things that we can do going forward. I want to outline some of this stuff that you know at least seems very real and very tangible to me. First of all, the incinerator is doable. Other people have done this. You know, Montgomery County's got to get over itself. You've got to start talking about we're the best, we're the only. We may be good, but we're no longer the best. We may have been in the lead at one point. We're no longer in the lead anymore. I can go to the District of Columbia, look at more aggressive measures 
to reduce pollution, more, more aggressive me measures to do recycling. Uh, so being good is no longer good enough. And we've got to stop talking about how good we are. We've got to stop talking about the fact that we buy, how much we buy in renewable energy while the energy we act, or while the pollution in Montgomery County actually increases. So we buy credits someplace else, which is nice, but if in your own backyard you're making the situation worse, and this is the air that we actually breathe and have to deal with, it's a problem. And the real solution isn't buying credits and saying I'm getting all this green energy from someplace else. The real solution is to not be relying on coal-fired power plants locally, which do produce pollution locally. It's getting people into electric cars rather than people living, you know, still living in the fuel world. I made the leap to a leaf. Um, I've had this car for five years. It's been an interesting adventure. I have <laughs> range anxiety on occasion. <laughs> um, I, I measure my success, how many little trees pop up in my thing rather than what's my maximum speed I can get out of the car. So it's, it does require a shift in mindset, but these are things we need to do. Um, we need to get aggressive with the solar energy. California did the right thing. They're going to require solar energy on residential units. We should be doing the same thing. I have a bill that requires, <laughs> that requires builders to at least offer solar energy on houses. And it requires on commercial buildings that they either go solar, they put on a reflective roof, or they do at least a green roof. But these are things we need to start requiring. Things won't change if we don't require it. We need, we've got a fleet of vehicles. We've got, to, we've got to turn this into an electric fleet as quickly as we can. We've got to hope that there's a change in technology that lets more of our trucks run on electricity rather than leaving our fleet dependent on gas, but as soon as those changes are possible, we need to do that. We need to revolutionize our transportation system. I put forward a bus rapid transit network, 110 miles is what I proposed in Montgomery County, would have connected all the communities from where people live to where they work, and at the time we were looking at you know the most efficient buses that you could have. Today, they make electric buses with ranges that exceed 200 miles. Buses no longer need to be charged en route. They don't have to take these long pauses that people said is going to mess up the timing of a bus system. You can have an electric bus fleet. We should have an electric bus fleet. Yeah. I, I, had to send, I had to send our staff a report from New York City that, that studied electric, gas, and diesel and said, oh, by the way, even though the electric vehicles cost more, life cycle costs for less, less because repairs, maintenance, and fuel costs for electric buses are less than the cost of operating either diesel or gas buses. And they said, oh, and that's a good thing because at least they took note of it. And I'm hopeful that this is the direction we move in to build a fleet or require a fleet of buses that is an electric fleet of buses and we can power them with solar energy. There's no reason now not to have at the stations where the buses will go home at night to sleep, to put them to sleep next to electric chargers that have been charged up during the day by the sun, stored in batteries, and then put into the buses at night. So this is a doable thing. We don't need to charge our buses with electricity that come from a power company. We can charge our buses with electricity that we generate on site. And that's the kind of movement that I think we need to make, and it's the movement we can make. We have a We have to push for higher efficiency standards. The federal government absolutely has to start requiring the most efficient appliances that you, that you can possibly create. And the county needs to be supportive of those kinds of actions. I want to see the county take another leap at the residential PACE program. Does anybody know what residential PACE is? A couple of you. Okay, so this is what the deal is. Um, people in California were able to put the cost of a solar system on their property, tax bills. And so they paid for it. If you bought a $20,000 solar system, the county fronted the money through a bond, but it was safe for the county because the county collected it back on the property tax, added it one twentieth of that bill over 20 years, and it got paid back over 20 years. And we were ready to do it in Montgomery County, and the banks came in and said, you can't do it. 
And they didn't understand what we were doing. We didn't, I don't think, fight hard enough to make it clear to them that we weren't putting a mortgage in front of their mortgage. This was going to ride on the property tax. California told the banks to go fish, and they are going ahead with the residential PACE program. We need to go forward with the residential yeah. PACE program. We've got to work with the farmers in the Ag Reserve on carbon sequestration. But I want to give you good news from the farmers. I've, I've spent a lot of time up there talking to people. And most of our farmers are using high-tech machinery where they're actually doing no-till and they're drilling through the soil. They're actually planting cover crops after they harvest. They're knocking them down before they plant and they're drilling through the cover in order to plant seeds. This is what we want because you don't have soil blowing away and you're not tilling the soil and it, and it keeps moisture and, it, and, and you're using your crops basically to replenish the soil of nutrients. It allows them to reduce the amount of pesticides and the amount of fertilizer. I'd like to get to no pesticides, but lowering the amount of pesticides is, is a big improvement and having them only put on what they absolutely need as opposed to the traditional practice of just blanket covering fields with pesticides and knowing that some of it's going to run off and the hope that some of it stays there, those days are going away. And the farmers of Montgomery County are actually leaders in this practice. So hopefully, as, as we make more advances in the field of agriculture, we can move them away from pesticides. I'm, I believed in the residential pesticide bill we passed here, and we were fighting in court to get this withheld. You know, we had this bill that would prevent the cosmetic use of um, you know, pesticides, and uh, hopefully we'll win in court and we'll get our bill reinstated. Um, and we need to work with Pepco or whoever the hell is our electric supplier and, and get into the world of microgrids because these can make electricity more efficient and reduce use. So I think, I think we've got a future in change here. But we need you. This will not happen with only people at the executive level and the council level. If there's no push from the bottom and from the community, it doesn't happen. You need to be the ambassadors. You need to be the foot soldiers. If you're going to have a climate emergency, then you need a climate mobilization. And a mobilization is not nine political or ten political officials in Montgomery County. That's not a mobilization. Mobilization is you and the community talking to your neighbors and getting them used to the idea that the changes we need to make are absolutely necessary. We've got to fight this nonsense about, you know, no point in doing it in Montgomery County if the rest of the country isn't going to do it. It's got to start somewhere. And it's got to start sooner than later. So it's not starting here, but we ought to be here on, we should be the early adopters. We should move this forward as quickly as we can, and we should be an example for the rest of the country and for the state of Maryland. I thank you all for the work you've got. You've made it possible for us to pass the legislation that we've passed, so keep up the pressure, keep up the work. I see Will Juwando here. You know, work with all of us, because we all want to be part of a better future. I don't want to hand, I already got grandkids. My grandkids are, you know, my oldest one's already 18. They don't need to get old in the same kind of environment or worse environment than what we're dealing with. And their kids don't need to inherit an ungodly mess, which is where we appear to be going. So everything we can do to make it better, we ought to do. And we need your help. So thank you.